I, I think because we touched on it last time uh, in our chat, masculinity, it's such a broad topic. Um, and a lot of guys get their noses out of place. Um, and I just want to say at the outset, this, this is just two guys sharing their own pedestrian opinion about it. Um, uh, it makes me laugh when people think you're, you're, you're speaking from some sort of pulpit as, um, you know, tablets in stone, you're writing down laws for everyone to follow and people to start objecting. Um, but yeah, in terms of, um, uh, masculinity, it's become, I've, my perception is it's become a lot more gray as the years go on. Um, mm -hmm. there, there wasn't this much, um, uh, how can I put it? There wasn't this much people getting their noses out of joint. And I think it's because it's disappearing more and more. It's become so vague. It's, it's getting lost. Um, and I started to think about, you know, you've got what is a male, what is a man and what is masculine? You know, you can right. sort of say the male is purely biological. That's easy. That's not gray at all. Although, well, I take that you, there is an exception to that though. I mean, one of the things that we've sort of fallen victim to culturally in the West, both in your country and, and certainly in North America is the idea of gender. Uh, ah. They have made being male gray. But now they're they're because the the theory of these idiot feminists is that sex is purely socialized, which is just insane from the beginning. And the, but that's why they've switched the language to call it gender. And one of the things I like to do is refuse to cooperate with that. Uh, I don't I don't have a gender. I have a sex. Well, I suppose that's where they can sort of um, gray. Um the the conversation and gray the area of getting anywhere at all is to regard everything as gender and everything is fluid. Um, I suppose you and I, it's not going to be popular, but talk from a binary standpoint and I'll, a classical binary standpoint, whether or not people like it or not, um, just to sort of talk in terms of what's, what's been lost and, um, how things may have changed in terms of perception and how it affects men. I don't, th I don't, I don't see that pissing off too many in our uh, respective audiences. Um, I do think in terms of, you know, mainstream, particularly gender ideolog ideological um, activists out there, uh, they do get upset when you talk about things in, in binary terms. Um, of course, Binary terms is how the world actually operates uh, outside of their imagination about what defines men, masculinity, women, sex. <clears throat> we have a binary, male and female. And there's some yeah, fringe yeah. stuff to discuss about that, but for the most part, that's where, that's where it's at. And I suppose it might be something in terms of the difference between the male mind and female mind is that the binary aspect isn't so, so much a narrow aspect. It's, it's kind of going towards a, a simplified clarification. So you yeah. can actually um, get somewhere or try to understand something. Whereas when you're trying to spin 56 genders um, and 56 ideas at once and give credence and respect to everything all the time, you actually get nowhere. So, and I think it's a, a, it's a, it might actually be a male or masculine, masculine trait um, rather than so – it's almost like the responsibility of trying to think simplistically like this, only having two options and seeing where we can get with it while recognizing there are gray areas in between, but the two dominant um, polarities are male and female, masculine, feminine – Masculine and feminine, um, male and female. And I think where we can sort of run afoul in a conversation is where, and I've seen this in, in some elements of the manosphere, is when the conversation becomes prescriptive, uh, prescriptive, excuse me, of what you need to be to be masculine, what you must be. 
in order to be considered a man uh, or a woman for that matter. Um, well, here's a question for you. Is masculinity important or necessary today? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, it's, it's funny that we have these ivory tower conversations uh, from people who have no idea, you know, how the cold air coming through the vents during the summer actually got there and what happens when they flush their toilet uh, as though, though they think their toilet is a magic box where uh, their excrement just disappears and, and nothing exists past that point. Yes, it takes masculine energy, men, risk takers, workers, um, out there doing what it takes in order to earn, run the world or run most of the world that we don't see. All the blue collar jobs, which are, I mean, yes, it's one thing to work at an office, but you have to build it. Uh, yeah. You have to design it and you have to maintain it after that. And all of that requires energy that I would typically define as masculine. I just wouldn't take the next apparently logical step in saying, well, in order to be a man, this is what you must do. You must build, you must um, uh, perform in some way. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I can, I tend to do this quite a bit. Like I try and step outside as the observer and see, you know, how and why perhaps the other side operates this way, um, gynocentrism. And we can talk about a whole range of things and we usually do. Um, but I, I get that now they, they want women to contribute to society, you know, greasing society with women, not just men as in the past. I get that. And so, you know, the first thing they did was erase femininity or make that clownish and mm -hmm. make, make women uh, try and pantomime men's masculinity or former what it was. Um, and yes, it's almost even as like, they're criticizing it. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like sometimes I think, um, why does gynocentrism dislike masculinity so much? It's almost like, and the classic definitions of it, you know, things like strength, hierarchy, leadership, order, respect, honor, those kind of things. And sometimes I think because women are now in the external world and, and trying to do these things that men once did, um, almost solely, that they do such a bad job at it generally um, that because they've gotten rid of their own femininity and sort of let go of that and, and amputated that, that they want to get rid of them of they want to make masculinity clownish too, so that we can all sort of just mix in this melding pot and there can't actually be any hierarchical standards or any sort of measures of excellence. Then you'd actually start to sort of, see the difference between the feminine and the masculine, like the, the inherent traits that one is better at generally than the other. Yeah. All exceptions duly noted. And, you know, everyone wants to be a superhero and celebrity, but generally sort of when all things are sorted out, when people's capabilities and their wills um, and, and all of that is sorted out. Um, it was a, it was a good way of organizing masculinity and femininity. So I think like now, how they want everyone to be working and taxed and um, everyone to be sort of controlled in this kind of system. Well, that's their claim. But we find when you examine where they advocate for that so-called androgyny to take over and uh, actually run things, that it stops the moment danger enters the picture. We've had 50 years of feminism, uh, 50 years ago, 93% of workplace fatalities were male. Today, 93% of workplace fatalities are male. Uh, the numbers barely took a bump in combat deaths. And as a matter of fact, the number of female deaths went up slightly, ever so slightly back during the Gulf War, and then went back down again, once we found out that people didn't have a taste for coffins with female bodies, uh, stamped members missing, being shipped back to the United States uh, from whatever our imperialistic endeavors were at the time. But it, it's just another round of hypocrisy. We want women in the corner office, but not in the basement, not in the furnace, not in on top of roofs or climbing skyscrapers. Uh, they're not 
screaming for more female ditch diggers. Uh, what they're looking for is that upper 1% of men who actually do run things and saying there, if we put women in their positions, then we'll have equality. It's nonsense. Yeah, I, I, th- I think it, it's going to be very hard, if not impossible, uh, because it's hardwired into women that th- they biologically, reproductively and historically uh, they've never been as forthright and actionable to sort of um, uh, make their make their stamp on the world. It's always been um, passively, like throwing the bait out to get men to do what they want. Um, you know, uh, they they sort of tend to be uh, emotionally more skillful at manipulation. I think so. There's always sort of this. Uh, there's this skill underlying getting what they want that men actually, again, it's a difference between feminine and masculine too. Um, and sort of, they keep running up against that. And so any, any of the hard stuff that happens in society, those instincts kick in. If it's too hard and I can't, and I, and I don't have the natural will to find it appealing to go even harder. Uh, I mean, I, I always cite things like um, things, you know, pedestrian things that a lot of guys enjoy, like going to the gym. Guys actually love the pain, the sweat and the work. And um, <clears throat> if you really pay attention and if you have an interest like you and I do, you you read between the lines and, and you listen to the drums and you look at the advertising. And because I've worked in the advertising field most of my career, I remember whenever we did... um. Uh, advertising for men as opposed to women, it's vastly, vastly different. And it's a, the funny thing is in when you're in the boardroom brainstorming um, generalizations, which are perfectly normal in the advertising field, because yeah. it wor- the you know the whole marketing and advertising industry works on generalization and absolutely nothing else. Um, and I remember when we we'd advertise say uh, for fitness the difference between men and women is the poster for men would have a guy with muscles sweating, grimacing with his teeth showing almost in pain. And that kind of image, that warrior kind of painful work image would motivate a man. Whereas doing a fitness image for a woman, she's not sweating. She looks beautiful. She's smiling. She's happy. There's no pain at all. And, and so the masculine and feminine, if people want to be real about it, is very, very different. Um, how it's perceived by females um, and how it's perceived by the opposite sex. But yeah, the, I think the frustration, especially for guys these days, is, is that we're, pretend, we're, we're buying the marketing uh, and we're buying the politics that we can't actually have an honest conversation. And what I find um, the one thing that keeps coming up over and over again is whenever I think about masculinity is not just, you know, as feminists like to think about it, I, most, and when, when I say feminist, I, I, I say most women because they love smiling and saying nothing when feminists speak for them publicly. They don't denounce them. They don't do anything. So I contend that the vast majority of women, if they're not feminists, they let feminism speak for them and they, they say nothing. They're feminists by omission, for sure. Yeah, so most modern women are feminists to me anyway. But what I find is that whenever you talk to them and you listen to them on media, is they see masculinity as almost like a boy putting on a superhero cape. They see it as something clownish, passe, boys with their toys, um, us putting on some sort of mask and acting like a hero and a tough guy. And it's like, you know, grow up and take off the masculinity suit. And sometimes I think it's because they were convinced long ago to throw away their femininity and they've severed that cord. They've severed that relationship to men and the relationship they had with themselves in terms of their strengths, in terms of femininity that now because they're on their own and they're attached so much to the system and the government and everything is that it's um, counterpart or what was that masculinity. Um, they do their best to shame it. 
um, for it to be non-existent. And yet nothing has changed in what fundamentally sexually attracts women to men, not a thing. Um, you know, I've, I've seen it said before, and I totally believe it, that if you want to understand a culture, forget the psychologists, forget the sociologists, look at advertising, which is mm. something you know something about. If you wonder, want to understand what motivates people, look at how we advertise, because they advertising runs purely off of a profit motive for getting the message right uh, to men and women. And I know that uh, you talked about an image of a man sweating and grunting and grimacing, almost in pain. Not only is that motivating for men, it's sexually motivating for women. Um, they want to see men. Uh, that's what turns them on. It's why all these guys that have, you know, man bun themselves into uh, being more effeminate um, find themselves lonely uh, without women while she hops on the back of a Harley with a guy. Now she may be, have just left a gender studies course where she's talking about the pitfalls of masculinity. We saw this, uh, oh my God, what was her name? Uh, the woman for he for she, um, Emma Watson or, or Emma Watson. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, she does this pro effeminate masculinity gig and, basically challenges all men to uh, drop the facade and be a more effeminate supporter of women. And she runs off with the, with jocks. Um, and that's yeah. how she spends her time. They're not really fooling anybody, I think in the red pill community, but the world is buying it enough that you can actually have a female James Bond and the world will continue to nod their heads and say, oh, how wonderful, a female James Bond, even as it does very poorly at a box office, these uh, recasting mm -hmm. women into these roles has not done well for the movies uh, overall that have done it, uh, but because it's not even realistic, uh, because they aren't being feminine. And yeah, they're going to they're gonna keep um, pounding that drum until it, it like a metronome, like until it um uh people just nod their heads to it uh because uh, it's almost like they've made um masculinity synonymous with racism or something even uttering the word because if they just concentrate on the traits the sort of uh the sort of uh high bar traits of what used to be masculinity in a classical sense like you know on a like uh, strength blah 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 then we can sort of start dispensing with ma mas masculine and feminine and we're all equal and we can politically sort of see ourselves on this sort of level playing field. And then people start uh, talking less and less about the male and the female and their respective natures that can actually help the things we're trying to do. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's hamstringing us even more and more if we erase the masculine and feminine uh, that are hardwired into that classical binary aspect of uh, what we are as animals. Because no matter what you try and do socially is people are going to continually uh, be on meds more and more when you tell them uh, rather than simplifying life and telling them, you know, the reason you're feeling you might be feeling this way or the reason why you're so confused and you don't know where to turn is because you're getting a, a thousand different messages flying off in, in every direction at once rather than a more, uh, again, not binary as in sexual, but binary as in like th there is a clearer way that used to be passed on from mentors and from mothers to, to daughters and from fathers to son in the past. And it used to be a lot more linear and it was, uh, it was foundational. And then once you sort of got that, you got the biology, you got the common sense, you got the sort of stability, then you could go off and be your own individual. You know, later on you could go off and be your Hemingway. And in these days where almost everything's permissible, once you've got the grounding of biology, male and female nature, what is our strengths and weaknesses, then if you've got some will and desire, go off and, you know, call yourself anything you want to 
call yourself, do anything you want to do. Great. But trying to confuse people intentionally as soon as they get out of the womb, um, I think just plays into the hands of, uh, not that there's some great sort of scheme that, but plays into the hands of sort of people that love sort of controlling society in certain ways. And it just sort of mutes and dilutes people individually. You just, and you, you'd notice this, the, the, the increased rates of suicide, depression, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, just all that kind of shit. The insecurity of the individual is gone. There's nothing to stand on. And if you get rid of the, the masculine, the last place where I th- where I see sort of um, conceptually, the la- one of the last places left that kind of any kind of stability, security, um, grounding, uh, courage, strength, all that kind of good stuff uh, resides. The moment that's extinguished, um, it, it doesn't look like a nice world to live in where everyone's so confused they don't know what's up or down. No, it's a terrible world to live in, and it's uh, continuing to circle the drain, mainly, I think, because one of the biggest mistakes we ever made culturally was giving women so much power. Um, women are in my opinion, and I'll get some criticism for this, they're inherently destructive. Um, Mm. They're inherently destructive of their relationships. Um, I can tell you from decades of working with men, I can't even begin to count how many men who told me she would rather see the ship she's in sink before she would own responsibility and keep it afloat. Mm. Well, they have, they have a natural look. The, the 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 feminine has a natural attraction, uh, a leaning in towards chaos, surprises. You know, Sur- yeah, like you know, just change, surprises, surprise me. Um, whereas uh, um, the masculine, the male, has a leaning towards an attra- an attraction to sort of uh, order, uh, sort of routine. Uh, yeah, but give me a second on this because I think it extends really far past that. You look at feminist policies, they undermine the very things that keep the world stable. They undermine families. Families are part of the fabric that keeps the world stable. I mean, I fully support the marriage strike. I think nobody in his right mind would get married these days, but I can't deny socially that. Families have been the foundation of a stable society for a long time. They, 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 when they were honored and respected, when it was difficult to get a divorce, they made the world go round. Masculine values, which are now being shunned. Um, the sort of assertiveness and dominance of men in certain areas is now being absolutely demonized. And... Mm. What do we have? We're starting to fill prisons with fatherless boys from families that that women and feminists have wrecked. Uh, They're creating all sorts of chaos and dysfunction. And left to their own devices, they're like children in a kindergarten. That if you take an authority figure away from them, they will destroy the room. And I see that happening all around us uh, all the time. And it's, no, I would not rob women of the right to vote. I wouldn't take their rights away. Uh, But I would have had a lot more thoughtfulness about how we approach things like family law and other matters and what we allow to pass for education in our institutions of of higher learning. They are teaching values and indoctrinating uh, people to do things like undermine and destroy the psychological profession. It's absolutely insane. Everything they touch turns to shit. And sooner or later, we have to look at the fact that it was the saving factor that could, that could have prevented so much of this is masculine values. And Um, the men uh, failed. I mean, just look at even, um, you you mentioned um, psychology and stuff. Um, The more you look into it, the more, women started to get involved in, in it. Uh, psychology used to belong under the rubric of philosophy back in the day. Um, but now it's sort of become its own thing because they, it's the sort of the scientific 
um, and philosoph philosophical mind sort of, uh, you know, it, it's not strong in most women. <clears throat> Try and talk to a woman about allegory and um, metaphors. <laughs> Good um, luck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's kind of like if I had any hair, I'd be pulling it out. That, that's my biggest frustration uh, with uh, many women uh, that I had and have in my life is that everything needs to be literal. And so you can, it's almost impossible to have deep and, and um, meaningful conversations where you sort of uh, connect concepts and you expand thinking because everything is so literal. The, the moment, yeah, you know, they'll, they'll watch them. That's why most women don't get the matrix as much as men do. It's, it's such a very simple concept to men, but, um, and even trying to talk historically, you know, you talk about sort of, uh, his, uh, uh you know, things like Zeus and, you know, Achilles and all these sort of, um, mythopoetic classical stories and allegories like, you know, um, these stories that described the human being aspiration failings, what to do, what not to do, how far to go, uh, trials and tribulations, um, the extent to which, you know, the, the hero's journey would go in life. And, uh, it's just something that's, uh, something that men kind of resonate with and, and get and understand the, the allegories involved, but to women, it's so literal. And you see it today, even with comedy that the biggest people that are triggered are the ones that take everything so literally, and they cannot see the metaphors and the figurative examples that people are trying to sort of um, say through these things. And I always wonder, Jesus Christ, the more they get in power, uh, the more gynocentrism expands without the ability to think abstractly and think with allegory, metaphor and symbolism, um, just the more chaos and the more people are going to be sort of insecure of fighting each other, centering each other because they don't have the confidence and um, the self-assuredness to be able to understand what a metaphor is without thinking literally all the time that someone's always trying to attack them. Well, yeah, I think my, excuse me while I'm fiddling with some lighting here, uh, my general experience with women and, for instance, trying to explain a metaphor, an allegory, or um, a, an archetype, the response generally is, what do you mean by that? Um, this is the level that they deal on. I mean, I know, yes, for those of you who will freak out, there are exceptions. Uh, I'm not denying it, but we have great masters of literature that were men for a reason. The, we don't have founding mothers of psychology for a reason. Uh, all the greatest master poets, the great symphony writers, people who understood the depths of the human intellectual and emotional experience, overwhelmingly male. Nobel laureates, overwhelmingly male. There's a reason for this. And I think there's a lot of envy in women. Well, first, I think fundamentally there's anger uh, at the core of their issues. And what they found, they, the one ace card that women have is no matter what they say, no matter how outlandish, um, people will listen to them. I, I was just discussing with Tom Golden a story of a feminist group that were separating hens from roosters and smashing eggs because the hens had been raped. And this, this, they were serious uh, about this. Um, you, know, you know the character trait I just thought of that sort of probably sums it up? Women, because they've divorced themselves from men, so to speak, like it's almost like they've married the government and they're like that woman that's pissed off because she's in a shitty marriage now. She's locked herself in. Right. So she's married to the government and now she's pissed off because it's not a comfortable existence. Now, that's a beautiful yeah. metaphor that I don't think very many women would understand. But Well, <laughs> well and, and I can understand that frustration. Imagine yourself as a guy, like you, you married the wrong woman. And now you've got this very limited 
claustrophobic life where there's no freedom or, or autonomy and you just sort of lash out at the world, you're pissed off, you're an alcoholic, um, you're just not the human being you want to be and you're annoyed, but you don't want to look in the mirror or do anything about it. You don't want to take the courage to actually go, you know what, maybe I was wrong, fuck this marriage. Um, I'm divorcing this person or this government or whatever. But they, they kind of, maybe it, it sort of uh, ties into their, their need for security that, okay, we've got all this great stuff. I don't have to worry about money anymore. I'm always got, I always have a soft landing um, that I'm married to the government, but I, I'm in such a shitty marriage to the government that everything else in my life is bad. It's like a, a man staying at a job only for the money and his boss is awful. Um, he works himself to death. He can't enjoy his life. And, and I think sort of uh, women have that, that aspect to them that, they don't like the marriage they're in now, this independent gynocentric feminist um, narrative that they're married to and that they've bought into. And the only, uh, the, the only positive thing they've got is the so-called ego boost they get and the power and the money they, that they can go out every weekend and, and buy shoes with and no man can tell them what to do. And they've got infinite options that, so they think, um, that's all. It's like a man just staying in a job for the money. And, and this, this frustration with women is that they don't want to let go of that job just because of the money. Yet the rest of their life is completely fucked. Um, well, they don't want to pay attention to the fact that in reality, most of them have worked their butts off to get to some crappy mid-level position in a cubicle where they're sitting there for eight or nine hours a day, missing their kids with bags under their eyes and but still trying to live by the narrative that this is empowering to them. Uh, it, I'd, I'd still maintain that the problem starts fundamentally. It's like when you leave men to their own devices, they go to the moon and they land spacecraft on comets and cure disease. When you leave women to their own devices, they come up with gender studies. Yeah. And this is the other thing I think uh, women feel so insecure and triggered. I, I think today because they've severed the feminine, they want nothing to do with it. That it's like men don't get their back up when you generalize about men or, you know, you could say men love cars and I don't get my back up because I don't love cars as much as the other men, the next man. It's a general fact. Generally men love cars or men are sexually driven. I agree. I might not be as much as the next guy, but men are. But because I'm still in touch with the reality of what a man is or what, what masculinity is, the more, and this is the other thing, the more self confident you are in yourself and the more confident you are in reality, in relation to yourself, you don't get triggered by what is true out there. Because if it's like someone saying to me, uh, human, you don't love your dad. I'll be going like, whatever, I don't care. I know I do. But it's almost like these women don't have an identity because they've gotten rid of the feminine that every fucking thing triggers them. It's like, especially the truth. Especially, yeah, reality. You know, it's like, uh, again, married to the government that pats them on the head like a child and, said, we're, and says, we'll censor everyone, we'll make the world a soft cotton wool place for you. And anytime you, you feel awful, just raise your voice, we'll hear and we'll come running like some hero and protect you. Um, when you think about it, this is not one iota different than the true examined lifestyle of traditional women. Uh, Peter Wright, dug up another book by Esther Villar, the woman who wrote uh, The Manipulated Man. Fantastic book. He found another book by her called The Polygamous Sex. And she describes in this that women's role in the home is to enhance their neoteny, their childlikeness, as much as possible in order to pr promote the parental brain in men, the parental brain that our, our fixed relationship with women 
when you don't want to look at it through a Freudian lens. It's enough to really turn your stomach when you really start thinking about, um, you know, we have like sexy outfits called baby dolls and women make themselves look as young as possible and they act childlike. You even have women baby talk uh, as grown women with a, a, a pile of stuffed animals on their bed. And they bring this to an adult relationship and they send all the cues that in every other animal on earth, every other mammal and, and uh, many non-mammals cues the parental brain, the instinct to take care of and to do so in the light of a child. Um, and this is what I see in feminism. This is what I see in women who marry the state and uh, forswear all men except whatever men will pay their bills. Um, and they become infantile. Uh, feminism is ultimately an in infantilizing uh, movement for women, but it's not that far from women in their natural state. Um, mm. I think one of the biggest challenges that men have is turning, if they're conscious enough as men, is turning an emotional toddler into a grown woman once they pair bond. And it's a very difficult job to get done because her instinct is to be as neotenous and childlike as possible in order to inspire a man to sacrifice on her behalf. Yeah, and 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 today they they're playing two opposing positions. When I listen to what you say, the the, the Freudian perspective is today they they operate just from two positions of what will give them power um, to to sort of get their way with men. They'll either act neotenous or they'll act like the mother. So they'll they'll be the dominant one that's that's or the authoritative figure over the man, or if that doesn't work if the gynocentric feminist script doesn't work, they act, they revert back to their biology and look up at you and bat their eyelids. Um, and so it's almost like, and, and, and nowhere in that equation is actually operating from a position as in classical femininity of something that's for them, for women, uh, something that they can operate through that will give them satisfaction uh, not just in relation to getting what they want from men. Uh, but yeah, when you talk about that, it makes me think, and it makes me think in the past of uh, women I've been with, when they run up against the, a wall with me, they can't get their way. I constantly observe them shifting between being trying to be the mother and then trying to be a child to get their way with me. If scolding and, doesn't work, maybe begging will. And it becomes laughable to say people uh, in say now that are called red pill that you naturally have an inclination to sort of read between the lines that, you know, I have an interest in this stuff. So it sticks out to me like dog's balls. So it's not, it's not subtle to me. It's not, um, it's not, it's not covert when I observe it. The, the language is actually very visible to me when I observe people and when I talk to people, and especially with women, the, the stuff that they try and get away with. And a lot of times they're not sort of scheming it consciously. You see it operating in them quite naturally. Yep. They, they, they vacillate between uh, being the mother or being Bambi. And it's, it's kind of like, I know what you're doing. Can you just stop uh, and act like a human being? <laughs> and the answer is no. In most cases, they can't. Uh, I don't think most women are capable of it. And the ones that are capable of it have to go through some pretty rigorous training in, in order to get there. It's not easy for them. And I'm not saying that in a condescending way. This is really what we socialize in women. We teach them that being childlike is going to get them their way. And we also teach them that if childlike, being childlike doesn't get you your way, then your anger about that is really righteous indignation. And you have every reason and right to take your frustration out on the man who's not fulfilling your childlike needs. Um, and we see them vacillate back and forth. What I find interesting on this is the, on the other end in men. 
is how many men, and I'm talking about men that wouldn't take a cross word in public from another man, and guys that are physically fit and strong in every masculine way you can imagine, and they see a woman shed a tear or talk baby talk or some way get childlike, and these guys are utterly defenseless. They get tongue-tied. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to defend themselves, and they end up bowing their heads and saying, okay, you're right. Yeah, that's biology. That's, it's, it's the same uh, I notice it in myself is no matter – uh, how much I know and how stoically strong I can feel. Um, when a short skirt walks by, I can feel a reflex. Um, sure. And the figurative tongue starting to hang out and salivate, uh, depending on how, how sort of how many uh, biological markers are coming off this woman that sort of resonate with me as a man. Um, but most guys, yeah, it's just jumping out of a plane. The adrenaline of, when biology kicks in, it's very hard. And the, the hard thing is it's, it's, it's a drug uh, for the non-intellectually curious. You go with it and it feels better than any, everything. I mean, what's the downside in that moment? I feel great. Um, I'm talking to her. I get sex. Um, I don't know what your problem is, human, or anyone who's, who's taken a bit of a red pill. Um, and the thing is, it's like, the, the masculine mind, again, it tends to be uh, a better chess player than the gynocentric mind. I won't say feminine mind because it's <laughs> femininity has been replaced by gynocentrism and feminism. Um, but yeah, it's just the worst chess player as far as I can see. Well, I think it's important for men to remember too is that when they're triggered by women's weakness, uh, you know, it's said that uh, for women, their weakness is their greatest strength. And that's absolutely true. And when men are triggered by that and they're disempowered by it and they don't know what to say or what to do, it's important to remember that's not your masculine mind at that moment. That is your parental brain. They've written books on this subject that when the parental brain is triggered, you adopt a whole new set of rules. And even your values get tossed out the window in order mm. to respond to the mandates of the parental brain. Um, I don't know if it's possible for really younger guys to, to overcome that. Uh, do you think, do you think um, it's, it's, it has been somewhat easier uh, for say non reproductively inclined men like you and I to recognize that about ourselves and sort of the male biology in and of itself to kind of go, Oh, I know what's happening here. And given that I'm not as reproductively inclined as the average male, as in, I don't want kids, then why the fuck am I treating you like, like, like a neotenous child? I don't even like, I don't even want children. So act like an adult. Like we can, we can actually demand that women raise their bar in relation to us because we don't want a lot of the neoteny that's being triggered. Well, I think that there's sort of a, a mixture of truths in there. Certainly, the, my age has a lot to do with my ability to overcome those instincts. They, I won't be manipulated by any woman anymore. It just, uh, it's impossible for them to do that. As a matter of fact, I, I in, rather enjoy making sport out of foiling their plans uh, to manipulate. Uh, it's, and it's easy for me. Could I have done that in my 20s? I doubt it. Uh, but I also didn't know in my 20s what I know now. Um, I, I was even inclined in my 20s when I, once I got so much shit from a woman, even though I was very reproductively inclined, I would draw a line and say no. Oh, and okay. I, so you were even in your youth. Yeah. I mean, I did have limits. I, I, I had lack of limits, like in a lot of ways, but I would only take it so far. I mean, I've seen guys that ruin their lives completely trying to chase a false notion of love with a woman. And I was never inclined to do that. Uh, but I made my share of mistakes in my youth, but I, I do think that there is the potential for some younger men 
to avoid being one of the ones that has to write me an email 10 years from now saying, okay, she's taken the house and the kids and wrecked my reputation and is sleeping with my brother. And I get emails like that uh, from guys who have ignored all the warning signs mm. and um, pursued the all- parental brain. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think also, I, I was listening to a conversation you, Paul and Janice were having recently about um, <clears throat> the Miley Cyrus article about heterosexually, uh, heterosexuality collapsing today, supposedly. Uh, do you think that's another thing? Like, you know, we, we sort of mentioned, you know, trying to sort of get rid of the past, uh, shame, antiquated notions of masculinity and femininity and now even heterosexuality, like get rid of it all. So we can sort of be this whole mess of unorganized, uncalibrated people who are sort of just trying to climb all over each other, uh, trying to sort of get anywhere. Um, well, yeah, you think that I plays think... a lot into it as well, like getting rid of heterosexuality and getting people against each other and, and erasing uh, a lot of the simplistic ways we sort of at least had some sort of compass about how to go about life with? Well, I think that they have succeeded into getting an awful lot of young men to act like pansies. And that makes swearing off heterosexuality a lot easier. Uh, if these guys had rebelled and hung on to their balls and to their spines, um, I don't think that would be near as an appealing proposition uh, as as it, it would be to a lot of them now. It also also begs the question, you know, holding on to your balls in relation to what, though? Because you've got the personality that if they're honest, um, if, if a really good psychiatrist got them on the couch, you determine that actually... Uh, their perspective in life, what they're driven by is ultimately uh, to be defined and validated as a man by women and by society. You know, that human doing aspect um, that tends to be sort of hardwired as a man. Um, And and that brought me to something as well. I wanted to ask you is, do you think uh, masculinity is subjective? Like, can it be personal or is it always relational? Like, can you only be masculine in relation to people, the world, the respect of other men? Um, or is it possible to be masculine on your own in the woods somewhere? You know, that saying, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's there to hear it, is it fucking masculine? So <laughs> well, I think relational masculinity is what has led most men to their deaths and to ridiculous, idiotic sacrifice for women. Uh, and sure. For- Sure, but uh, what, what about sort of the um, the civilization that's been built through masculinity? A lot of that's been relational too. Well, yeah, I'm, it's a definitely a two-edged sword, but the, I I don't think that you have to settle for relational masculinity um, mm-hmm. at the cost that it comes by in modern times. Um, I mean, it always had a cost, you know the. Uh, they named some highways that have been built dead man highways because so many people get killed building them and other projects and like that. That's sort of part of, of the masculinity that you're talking about that's relational and mm. it's driven by society's needs. But we do live in an age where we do have some choices. Um, my masculinity is not contingent on what any motherfucker on this planet thinks of who I am. Um, that's a choice. Um, whether women think I'm masculine, I don't care. Uh, I know I'm masculine, uh, and that is good enough for me. Mm. Uh, I suppose it, I suppose it, I suppose it, again, the language today, like sometimes I'm not, not sure what to think. Cause to me, that's just knowing yourself as a man. Um, because I, I was, I think, uh, I heard Stefan Molyneux recently say that his definition of masculinity is basically protection and provision. So it is pretty relational. Like it's about. Yeah, I think he's wrong about that. Yeah. Uh, Look, it can, I think it also can come down to the particular personality type you've got. So, say you and I, we don't respect ourselves if we don't place ourselves first. And then from there, 
we we're quite happy, proud, and we feel good about contributing to the world and other people and cooperating. But if we place ourselves second, it's um, I, I, whenever I place myself second and I know I'm lying to myself and I'm just saying yes to a woman or society and, and living a life I don't want to live. I feel like I've touched the Sti- uh, like I've touched a sticky doorknob. Like I, well, I, just, yeah, I bet in your view, you probably have diminished your masculinity to some degree in doing that. Yeah, or identity, which happens to be uh, again, is it relational or not? Oh, look, I'm just, I'm just sort yeah. of thinking out loud. Yeah, and you I'm know? speculating along with you, but I, I would have to say that ultimately, if you, if we take a Maslow-esque look at, at this through that filter that to self-actualize, uh, you're going to have to depend on your own interpretation of who you are and what you are, that ultimately you're going to have to transcend what the world wants from you. Because if we're really honest, what the world wants from men is to suffer in silence and give all our shit away uh, to people mm-hmm. who are not working for it. That is what's wanted. And if we die for it, we're heroes. Um, that is relational masculinity to me, to me. And Mm. so at my age, I've moved on to the point, you know what? I figured out a long time ago, I was shit at working on cars. I used to have an empty spot in myself about that. It's like, God, all my male buddies, they're turning wrenches. They know exactly what to do. And I was jealous and I felt inadequate in that way. I got over that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you start, yeah, you start to re- realize different people are, di- are good at different things. I yes. mean, that, that, that stuff is good when you're really young and you don't yep. know much at all. That's a massive strength uh, to be sort of uh, physically um, uh, uh, sort of engaged with the world in such a tactile way with someone like you or I who are probably more a little bit more cerebral. Um, and uh, creative and you feel like, oh shit. I, and you sort of, uh, you feel like you don't have much strength at all because you can't do these um, ostensibly tough guy things. Yep. And as you get older, I, I always started to, I, I felt myself grow just conceptually. Like, uh, like I started to see myself peer over these people that I actually looked up to that were these tough guys in the high school. And I actually saw saw them getting smaller um, because all they were was the guy with the wrench who chased after pussy um, and got into fights. And um, yeah, I, I started to sort of uh, notice the, the strength was in uh, people who had something to say, who are actually intelligent um, and who saw the world in a different way. Now and, maybe you know, that's I learned, just... to learn to say, you know, you may be able to go in there and, you know, rip that carburetor out and rebuild it and, and, and put it back in. But guess what? I can get that done with my finger pushing on the telephone. Which one of us <laughs> is better? Yeah. Look, <laughs> but then, then those guys, again, in terms of masculinity, it's like those guys that say, well, that's a, that, that they turn that as a feminine trait. Women do that. Sure. They call up the, the, the gardener. And I kind of, uh, I, I like observing that in myself too. Like a, a lot of things I'll, I'll admit, you know, I, I don't have the typical masculine traits of many uh, men who can grab a wrench and fix a car and who would sort of die for their family and uh, 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 red blooded supporters of their football team. Um, I'm cut from a very different cloth, but I know that when I get talking with some of those men, um, I don't admire much about them. And I think as I get older, those type of men, not that they admire more about me, but they, <clears throat> they, they, they want to lean into life a bit more uh, the way you and I are, the way writers are, the, ra- the way intellectuals are, because... I mean, youth is just built for sex and sex and the physical. And when that kind of man, when he's had his day past middle age now, you can't play with those tools anymore. 
all you're left with is your mind and uh, a sensible way of operating the world. You know, if you're stuck chasing pussy and fixing cars, when you're a 50, 60 year old man, it's, I don't know. It's like living a life of looking at photographs every day. Can, I don't yeah. Know. You've only got your memories and bad elbows to show for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to kind of transcend that at some point and some guys do good on them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in terms of masculinity as well, not to get straight too far, of course, is um, <clears throat> yeah, that relational aspect is something I, I, um, I, I thought was interesting uh, because it's been watered down so much that it's almost like you can't even use the, have you even, have you even noticed that in public you, you can barely use the word masculine? It's almost oh, yeah. like, it's almost like you're, you're, you're mentioning, it's almost like the word porn can be uttered a lot easier than the word masculine. Yes. Um, and that is the world we live in. And that is to me that with the enabling, and complicity of men, this is the world that women have built. That, and it's the very thing that still they are attracted to is masculine. That's what mm. gets women's attention more than any of this effeminate shit, yet there's somehow now a prohibition on talking about masculinity except to deride it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a, it's a tough one because I think for the young guy, it, it, it must be so tough to have this coursing through your veins to want nothing more than the female and um, not going, not knowing how to go about it today because the whole script today is it's like a, a role in a movie that's just written for her. And he's supposed to play in it, though he hasn't got a script at all, other than to peek over her shoulder and try and mimic um, how a female acts or approves of to actually be in this movie. And there's a, a, almost no roles for men. And the, the only way, it's a scary thought. I think it's almost like men have to be more courageous than they ever were in the past. But then the next thing I think of is, for fucking what for women uh and this is the thing i get with traditionalists when they sort of say it's it's gotten so bad men need to uh take the women back and and fight for them and 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 all this but it's like yeah but the the other side of it is for what if if there's not an overwhelming sense that you're not going to be fucking castrated uh fined imprisoned censored or your life ruined for actually trying to be courageous. And this is a frustrating conversation I have with some women is they still think that even if they agree with me, they'll nod their heads to everything I'm saying in terms of the way the world is now. Women are unhappy. Uh, men are silenced. Men are walking away. Men are going their own way. They're not getting married. Everything's going in decline and women aren't happy. And women's response is, yeah, men need to sort of just be more masculine and um, turn it around and, um, and basically take the bull by the horns. And it's frustrating to say, but there's no reason to, in terms of self-respect as a man, why would I, why would I debase myself for what, what am I getting out of it? And two, even if there is something I want, the overwhelming, uh, the overwhelming case would be, I'll be fine censored, uh, you know, I would have ne negative consequences. Uh, it's, it's being a heretic in a, in a gynocentric world. So th that's the thing I, I think is very difficult for the horny reproductively inclined younger male today is what for. And even if I wanted to, I can't. Men are finding out that the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Oh, look, they, they know that, but it's, uh, yeah, the double-edged sword you, you talk about, even as a man, um, in, in today's world, even if you, if you sort of um, try and mitigate women out of the equation, just to try and sort of live a good life for yourself. I mean, I talk with some MGTOW guys, 
and their world uh, where they can actually feel free to be more of who they are, they are and autonomous is that they, they, they feel like they need to retreat from the world more and more and not just physically in their lifestyle, but even the language. And for someone like me, that's the most frustrating bit that I can't have conversations out there casually. Um, it's not about fear the way I would with say you, I have to seek out vet the pathways of conversation digitally and not just in terms of masculinity, be able to talk with anyone at a coffee shop, male or female, just about the truth. That's where it frustrates me. And this isn't talking about sort of a horny young man full of testosterone. This is uh, talking about men past middle age as well. That that's become constricted in terms of older masculinity, just being able to be a confident, uh, intellectually curious person wanting to engage with others and mentor and connect with the world. Uh, that's the part that frustrates me personally. Well, I understand that. I mean, and here's where, you know, I, I know I'll piss a couple of people off in the MGTOW community. I've seen the same thing that you've seen. And well, again, I want to be very clear that I'm incredibly supportive of the idea of MGTOW. But when I see guys, I'll give you one example, talking about relationships and saying, the, I can't deal with women because no matter what you do with women, you end up being wrong. And I think, what a fucking cowardly, cowardly thing to say, that you can't know your values, know when you're right, know when you're wrong, and hold by that with a woman. How fucking weak are you? I mean, and it's not, I understand and get when a guy swears off women because they're petulant children, they're too much trouble, doesn't want to mess with them. I don't have a problem with that. I, I, I get it entirely. But when a guy plays this powerless routine, I can't go out in society. I can't interact with people. I can't be a part of the world. I can't communicate with a woman because she's always going to be right. And I'm going to end up feeling bad. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, what are you even sucking air for? Um, yeah, look, I, I just can't abide by that. Yeah. It's almost like, um, I don't disagree with you. Um, but it's almost like, uh, I wouldn't put it as bluntly as that, but I can understand it because it's almost like the father, um, feeling sympathy for his son and his son being like, Oh, I can't talk to women. I can't do this. They walk all over me. I have no power. And you're so frustrated that you want your son to have balls because you love him. Um, so and that is the feeling that is, yeah. the, um, and it is, yeah, and I'm a, I'm a blunt person and mm. it's, it's not like, you're, it's not like you're shitting over men the way women do. It's like you, you feel such sympathy for men that you love and you could see parts of yourself in them when you were younger and you think for fuck's sake, it's the older you trying to. Uh, love a younger man in a mentoring elderly fashion. And, and that's the way men do. And it's uh, the masculine way. Exactly. Uh -huh. that Men want to admire each other. They yeah. do. They, they want to be connected to men that they admire and who admire them. They actually want women to admire them too. But that's part of the masculine experience is to earn respect. And that you, you, you hate to see your friends weak and giving up and throwing in the towel on lives. And it does. Generally, it, 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 a good friend in masculine circles will sometimes get angry at you if they see you behaving this way. Yeah. And that's a function of love too. I think maybe they're so used to being shamed as men by women that any kind... So now even tough love and the camaraderie, the fraternity of men trying to impart tough, tough love to other men, like you're, you're suggesting. Um, it, it's all synonymous to them. It's like, oh, you're shaming me too. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this world. Um, I've, I have no place in it. I mean, that's a, that's a broader conversation in and of itself that plays into this. Um, but yeah, I, I feel real 
like you said, if some guys kind of like, no, nah, I don't want to have anything to do with women. They're too much trouble. Fuck them. If it's not coming from a stance where they feel scared, um, it's not like I hate them for it, but it's like, fuck man, don't throw your life down the toilet. You just be, be strong in your life for yourself. You don't want to have any, like have that same attitude, but for, from a more self-actualized confidence standpoint where fuck women, I'm going to live in my own little world, my own subjective solipsistic world. Um, women are too much trouble. Um, the juice isn't worth a squeeze. As you said, that's very different from, I can't, women won't let me, um, no matter what That's I exactly do, what I'm saying, yes, yeah, I get frustrated in that too. Where, like, I want to give them sympathy. I don't want to shame them the way women have been, and I am not trying to. But I also don't want to coddle them and make them even more obsequious and weak. Uh, so then, when they're out in the world, uh, they're even more fragile uh, that they can't even look uh, the cash register chick in the eye when they're scanning through their their packet of chips. Um, yeah, I just, I, I feel sympathy for men. And I know that the masculine way isn't to coddle them like their mother. I'm not saying it's my job to tell any man what it means to be a man. But I will say from my personal perspective that men who have thrown in the towel and said, I can't, the world won't let me, that is ultimately the surrender of masculinity. It is. It is forsaking your own sense of masculinity. I believe very strongly. I believe in men carving out a place in the world. The world doesn't always cooperate. So be it. That means you've got to strike the chisel harder and carve out a place for yourself in this world. Um, But when you look at it, masculinity, you could almost see it as a good way to be a man. Yeah. Good enough for me. It works. And it doesn't have to involve, I don't like any shaming about you're not, you know, man up, that sort of thing. Man up, go do what I do. Um, that to me is rejection. I, I'm happy to flip those guys off. Uh, mm. No problem. Uh, I, I think in today's gynocentric world where nothing means anything, they kind of, you know, where nothing can mean anything, like, uh, uh, whether it's the genders or whatever, or um, they, they try and say that, well, masculinity can be anything. You know, today's masculinity needs to be redefined. They look at it almost like art. So, you know, what is masculinity? There's no one way to look at it. Well, it's like, no, there is a way to look at it. Even if it was like art. Masculinities. Yeah. <laughs> Well, even if you were to correlate it to art, I can look at art and I can tell you what's a piece of shit and what's good. It's the skill at being able to like different forms of art, music and whatever. There's someone that's just sort of gesticulating and and kind of trying to be artistic. And there's someone who's actually skillful at being an artist in their own way. And I think masculinity, if you were to look at it that way, is someone... Uh, a self-respecting, skillful man who's confident. You can actually see it. Um, so it's not you can be a, a weak masculine or a strong masculine or an unconfident masculine man. You can't. You can't be unconfident and masculine. You can't be unskillful, um, figuratively speaking, and unmasculine. There's a, there's a suggestion and an implication of like a, a high bar, a, a skillfulness to go about being a man, being a good man, not just uh, because I am a male, I am by default masculine. No, you're not. Well, uh, you know, it's sort of like pornography. Uh, I can't really define it, but I goddamn well know it when I see it. Um, <laughs> one of the things that Warren Farrell came up with, which really caught my attention a long time ago in the, back in 93, when he wrote the myth of male power was they did behavioral studies above Navy ships during emergency situations. And what they found was with women on the ships that during fires, that a man would grab, you know, uh, doors on ships open with wheels, metal wheels on them that you have open. That when there was a fire in a ship, that men, in order to get their comrades out of a room with a fire, 
would grab hold of a hot wheel and open the door, even though it burned their flesh severely. Not a single woman would do it. Yeah. None yeah. of them. And that to me, it, it runs into the area. I don't want to glorify disposability for men. I, I, I think we got to be cautious about that. But when I look at, are you willing to sacrifice to save the guy next to you? I want a masculine guy there. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's undeniable when you look at it. I, I don't like to admit it, but if if I'm honest, like, like look, I look at the male reflexes. Think about how many guys you probably would have uh, had your ears privy to this more than I in, in terms of uh, therapy and listening to men. Is that <clears throat> men after breakups, uh, divorces, and severe trauma of that like? Um, a lot of times they have the mentality. Um, I'm going to end it all and she'll be sorry. Whereas women don't tend to have that mentality. They don't tend to sort of, I will sacrifice myself to prove my worth. They'll be sorry. And then I'll be valued. If I end myself, I'll be valued. Then women don't think that way. No, they don't. And guys, if you ever contemplate killing yourself in order as a matter of retribution to a woman, the first thing she's going to wonder is if you're insured. <laughs> yeah I've, I've i've said this story again whether it's masculinity or whatever and guys sort of feeling less anxious and uh finding stability mentally in this world is the more you can sort of don't disregard stuff that's worked for thousands of years and been passed on like masculinity femininity um the nature of men and women um if nothing means everything means everything and nothing means nothing and you don't know what way up and down is. Uh, your world's just going to get worse. Uh, I mentioned this story a few times. Is I remember a long time ago where I noticed the very big glaring um, difference in terms of what we were just talking about in terms of uh, a woman wouldn't sacrifice herself, whereas a man, his first instinct to show how much he loves is to sacrifice himself. Um, I remember an old ex of mine when things were going really well, um, and she would say to me, would you die for me? And she, and then she followed that up by saying, because I'd kill for you. <laughs> and I noticed, isn't that different? <laughs> Absolutely. That no Self-awareness to that whatsoever. But, but that told me a lot about the nature of men and women and how we value each other and where we get off on it. Uh, whereas Men was like, yeah, I would die for you because I love you so much. And a woman would be, I would kill for you because I love you so much. <laughs> Death plays a very different role. Yes, absolutely. But men can get better. I'm living proof. Uh, when at my last divorce, my wife asked me if I had thought of suicide. I said, no, homicide. <laughs> well, this video is not getting monetized. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it'll join the ranks with others on my channel. <laughs> yeah.